And we're off. We're back. We're back again. Back in the saddle. Oh, I was just thinking that. What is that? That's uh, Aerosmith, I think. I have no idea. Aerosmith I don't know how song. I know that. Aerosmith, not that good. I agree with that. Yeah. It's surprising to me how he's still so relevant. But when you said that, I, Tyler. that's right. Uh, he has a wild wardrobe. Um, he's got to be like, you know, up there. He does. Uh, and then it reminded me, as I was thinking that, your live auction item this weekend, Shayla, back in the saddle, horseback riding. Horseback riding. With is Father the... Brian and Rosemary. <laughs> oh, it's going to be awesome. I really do kind of, you know, I put myself out there. You do. Sometimes because other people force me. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, uh, how you doing? I'm good, man. I, uh, I'm good. I'm a little tired. Yeah. But, You're uh, running in a lot of direction. It is, you know, we're, we're six months into this whole pastor of two parishes thing. Yeah. And that's, it's been a challenge. I'm not going to lie. It's totally. not an easy dynamic. And we're trying to, you know, I think we're in, we're in a place where we're ready to really set the vision and talk about where we're heading moving forward. But, uh, it is a little, I'm going to use the word discombobulated. Yeah. Because uh, you're always kind of back and forth. And I think a lot of people feel like, oh, I feel we never see you. And, and I just, I kind of hear that. Well, well I think I, I've said that before too. Like before I started working here, <clears throat> I just kind of envisioned priest life being like, even working, like not only just for you, but even for myself coming to work here. Yeah. Like I'll, you know, do the rosary on a walk and then I'll <laughs> study and like maybe do some development. But seeing your day in and out um, and priest life is not what I expected. It is wild it's how not what busy I you are. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I'm always fighting. I'm always like, Lord, I, I know you want me to live an ordered life. Yeah. I know you want that. I know you want me to be generous, but I know you also want me to be ordered. I need to fight for order in my life. When you say, what do you mean ordered? So ordered means it's, it's, uh, it has a, a rule to it and it's, it's going towards what it is and okay so it's ordered for it ordered has like a directionality to it yeah and so like uh uh and a religious order is is a group that lives by a rule of life and so like just dis, being disordered would mean that your life is not moving towards what is good got it and so so a disordered life, right? Uh, in my kind of own particular form of dysfunction, just kind of the easy thing is what we call activism, which is always act, go, 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 Got go, it. go. And what it ends up doing is it, it actually works against the good. So at the end of the day, I'm actually, what's, what's good both for me, but just in and of itself, is a life that's... Um, rooted in prayer and yep. contemplation and silence and study. And it can't be all of that as a parish, but a proper amount of that is necessary for a life that's fully heard. Kind of like when, uh, when you're on a plane and they're, when the, they're, you're taken off and they're like, well, if the oxygen mask come down, put it on yourself before you put it on someone else. Yeah. And trying to keep that order. So you have, the right frame of mind and energy mm -hmm. when you're with people. Yeah, that's okay. I, I think that's good. You could think of it. There could be tons of analogies for this, but you could think of it as Christian. You know, I mean, you might, you might be, you might like pasta, which I do, but if that's all you ever eat, that's that's disordered because it's not working towards the good of human. Got it. Yeah. So you think the cookie monster is disordered? I'm going to go with yes. As much as I love him, he's cuddly and, you know, you got to love the cookie. Yeah. I actually don't remember much of that. And um, I don't want to deviate too much because it's actually a good segue into where hopefully we go with this podcast. Hopefully. But you never know. You never you know. You never know where it's just like one of my homilies. You never I, know where it's going. <laughs> how many overtimes. Yeah. Um, is, so I didn't grow up much with the whole Sesame Street vibe, but I'm so sad. I grew up on Full House. Oh, yeah. Bob, Bob Saget, Saget died. died. Yeah. 
And that's totally, I mean, that's San Francisco. It's this is the whole nine you. yards. I mean, yeah. that was, that was like my first crush. Yeah. Which, was, which, which girl? Um, DJ. Oh, DJ, DJ Tanner. DJ Tan- Tanner, is that what it That's was? right. Because yeah. the Olsen twins were younger. Yeah, they were like little Stephanie kids. was all right. And then DJ was a babe. Yeah, I could see that one. But I was so sad about Bob Saget. Um, so. Yeah, may he rest in peace. That's right. Um, and then a quick shout out here. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to do John Kelly. And, and we just saw him. And this is his test. He says he doesn't listen. But he said he would. So, John Kelly. John Kelly's a, John an Kelly, amazing John Kelly, consider mad. yourself tested. He, him and Margaret are like second family to Steph and myself. They're just awesome. Yeah, me too. No, they're, they're great people. John, ever since my first dinner with the Kellys where John was punching me, he kept making points and he punched me, and Margaret was like gritting her teeth and stop hitting the tree. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That's actually hysterical. It is funny. Because John's like, just like guys do, he's like, he's yeah. Like, Right, if be right, and he's like, you know, he's hit me in the chest or whatever. And Margaret, I, I guess I went up to like use the restroom, and Margaret, stop what are you doing? hitting the priest. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's funny. That's a risky move. Like, if it's somebody I'm like clicking with first time, yeah, like, no issues. But if you're not clicking, I beg, dude, stop touching me, stop yeah. hitting me. I'm gonna hit you back. Yeah, no, John's, John's a great friend, he's, the he's best. done a lot for our parish and our school. Yeah. He's a he's a very gifted he just knows how to handle uh directions and like that's wrong um vision. Like he's really good with vision right. and then execution too. And he just he can handle meetings and people and ideas. He's just a really gifted guy. He knows how to get things done is maybe the yeah. best way to say. It. And he also those- uh especially from the standpoint of vision, he's someone that uh also can think outside the box and, and just bring up things kind of not necessarily like devil's advocate, but thinks of many possible outcomes mm-hmm. and tries to do like, how do we address if this happens? It's a good learning lesson. So I just have to say this though. I feel like we're being way too positive. My, my real friend. No, I'm never. The- That's right. I'm just like, whatever. John we're hyping Kelly, him up. Loser. That's right. <laughs> we can't give him too far. So hopefully, yeah. uh, if he listens then great. So, but if not, the next time he'll never know. And we just, Treat them the way we normally do, yeah. especially you. I want to say one thing from last week's podcast. If you've been following the news, the the right. internet like blew up over Francis's comments about uh, people who choose children or choose pets instead of children. They're being selfish. The oh my gosh, the entitled rich West just lost its mind over that comment. It's so funny, but I was reading today, and this guy had this great comment. Uh, but how did he say this? Uh, he's critiquing a guy who's, who is going after Pope Francis, and uh, I'm not even going to read it. But basically, uh, this guy goes after and he says, you know, it's actually better not to have kids because more people are going to be more happy. And so the world's going to be a better place. And it's a really selfless act to not have children because you're, in, you're, you're reducing the impact on the environment and all this stuff. And this guy was just great. He's like, Catholics don't believe in utilitarian. That you can calculate happiness. Because that's what this guy did in this article. Just straight up utilitarian. He's just like, more happiness, more people, calculated, less children. That's that what makes the world a better place. And this guy was just brilliant. He just went after me. Catholics are not utilitarians. You can't, you can't calculate the value of a person. Yeah. At least to a very bad place. But that's what utilitarian does because it, it claims that you can calculate like pleasure versus pain, pleasure, good pain, bad. And you can calculate that. And that's how people justify things. Like well, this kid's life is going to suck anyway. So should we just kill him? That's right. Which is so evil. It just blows my mind. And this, this article uh, was in the National Post, which I don't think I've ever heard about. A guy named John Robson, truly a pastor. But he just, I thought he did a great job. He just said, Pope Francis, everybody's freaking out because he said something true in the news. Yeah. And that life is really not about your extra television and your second home. The children kind of 
show the world that life is meaningful and that at the end of the day, uh, loving a child is, is at the heart of what it means to be a human being. Uh, so anyway, it was just so good. I was like cheering this guy on. He also said, uh, these people were talking about how like, uh, oh, who wants to bring a child into the world today? Like there's, there's like, uh, climate change disasters happening. And inflation's on the rise and the job market's low. And he just said it just straight up. He's like, is that what life's about? Right. Is a life not good because there's bad things happening in the world? Hasn't that happened in every period of human history? And so therefore life isn't worth living? Who are you? And I just, I thought it was this great illustration of when we lose Christianity, when we reject Christianity, we're rejecting where Western civilization has moved to see what life is about and what, what is good and it's the foundation of all society and you end up with these kind of idiots on the internet saying well you know if i don't make a certain income level then life isn't really good and so we shouldn't have children right it's insane keyboard warriors showing up um do you think in primarily let's just say with catholicism no public you know the saying no publicity is bad publicity and I, I know that's a risky yeah. thing, of, uh-huh. especially with scandals and whatnot. But from the standpoint of, you know, when you look at that title and you're like, oh, we were getting destroyed. But I think it opens up the avenue for a lot of people to then explain. Do you know what I mean? Like this guy now has a chance to actually elaborate versus what's just being assumed. And even in like the scandal scenario, just to address that, because that'd be the number one like counter right away. Right. Is it? It gives people, if they take the chance to, one, say it, but also on the flip side, people to listen, it gives a chance for people to explain our faith, which is very deep. Yeah, I could see that. On a certain level, I do think, uh, I understand what they say when they use that phrase, no publicity, publicity, or or the other way around, however it would go the other way around. But I think, here's a problem with that, though. That, That kind of, aphorism comes out of the modern world that is all based on being hip and trendy and, and Catholicism, right? Doesn't care about that. like we want to save souls and we want, we want the chance. And I think that's where you're right. We want the chance to make the case for the beauty and the radiance of, of the Catholic faith. But we just live in this world where everyone's got, everything is hip for about half a second. And so everybody's trying to keep up with what's, what's new. And the, the Catholic Church lives, it doesn't think that. Right? The Catholic Church thinks there are certain things that are written on the human heart. They're written into the way the world is created. And those things are going to be true no matter what. So they neither come into style or go out of style, really, even though society might think they do. But actually, because God's written things on our heart, uh, they're always present, and I, I think I think it's better. I think we're better off in the church to just think. Do you think, though, at some point, um, when are we? And, and, well, I guess take a step back. When you're saying that, does that mean keeping up on like the meat on uh, uh, not media front, but like as we progress and do more the technology? Or what do you mean? Like technology. Okay, what and, about and technology? So when you're saying uh, things are written on the human heart, yeah, and we're not trying to keep up with what's cool and what's now, right? What is that connection? Like what when you're saying what's cool and what's now? So what, it's not saying that. Um, uh, it's not saying the technology's bad or any of these things, but every every age and every five minutes, honestly, yeah. like every, I mean, we all know this. In the media, and it doesn't have to just be the media, before there was the, the television media or the internet media, this is a human reality. But, you know, every 10 minutes, the world's going to collapse. Do you ever notice that? Totally. Like every 10 minutes. And in a certain sense, the Catholic has a bigger perspective, a broader perspective than that. Got so it. G.K. Chesterton has a great line where he says, he says every age loses its mind on some issue. The Catholic thing is to is to not lose its mind. Totally. Right? Okay. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and so there's always 
people are always outraged by something. It's yep. not just our particular moment. I don't, although I do think we're, we've gone crazy in a very unique and fun way in our time about, That's right. about losing our minds over everything. But uh, in history, though, that happens. And the church, the church is more grounded. She's anchored, She's anchored yep. in eternal life. She is anchored in truths that don't change. And the trends and the controversies of the moment, they might be important. And so there's this weird balance. I'm always torn with how much do I need to know current? That's what I was just going to ask. I'm always torn about that. Because yeah. at a certain level, I think it's important so you can speak to the, the, the world. The problem is the world's always losing its damn mind. Right. It always. Well, and don't you think that also is it's getting worse from the standpoint, especially as we get more and more immediate access to news and you have Twitter that's instant updates compared to, you know, as, as technology has progressed, but negativity sells. Right, like it's very hard totally. to, it's very hard to sell a story on Pope Francis and how it was so impactful of what he said about comparing animals yeah. to children. So you spin it, and and that is what is sold. Therefore, that's the narrative, and it's getting right harder because it's harder to navigate because things are so instantaneous. So unless you truly unplug and just not really pay attention to yeah. current events, otherwise it's scary. I mean, because well, because the danger of it is that. What ends up happening is you don't actually live in what's totally. So everyone is on Twitter or whatever, and they're upset about something that someone said in France. Yeah, and they don't interact with the their neighbor who lives next door. They don't even know. Like I don't in this in this place. I don't know who the neighbors are. Yeah, and there's this danger that we just live mediated life. And Thomas Merton, in my mind, is a great prophet of this in a lot of ways. Thomas Merton's always talking about how you're just going to live a better life if you stay away from the media, turn off the radio. And he's like, look at the stars, uh, be in contact with the things that God created, unmedia. Yep. I actually said this other book that got your phone off. New book yeah. I started, DC Schindler, The Politics of Real, hashtag Father John Nepple. I'm super pumped about this book. But I listened to him on a, um, it was actually a podcast from Notre Dame. And he was talking about something else, but he, he mentioned like, we just need to be human and we need to be in touch with, with things that are not technologically driven. Not that technology is evil, but our whole lives are dominated by technology. And one thing he mentioned, which of course I was super intrigued by and was like, man, I got to do that. Is he's like, you should make your own bread. Okay. Don't buy bread from this huge manufacturer and at the grocery store. Do human things. Make things with your hands. Be in touch with what's possible. Things that are not mediated. Oh. It kind of brings you back to the like the present moment. Like you, when you taught me yeah. how to make pasta. And that, other than it's <laughs> very time consuming, it's, it's one of the coolest consuming. things. It's one of my favorite things to do. And that actual process of doing it, and even when you had that uh, pan that, like, muddled, not muddled, but the tomato uh, and it. Um, what is that called? The, the food mill. The food mill. Yeah. Like, I had never seen that. Like, but it'll, you know, when you're really doing that, you're so in the present moment. Yeah. It's amazing. We all, all of us have these critiques of technology. Balthazar, of course, has a great line on this. And again, you got to remember, Balthazar died in 1980. So think about how much technology has right. changed. That's right. But Balthazar talks about the, uh, one of his favorite phrases is the anima technica vacua. Totally. Yes. We should make sure. We, that actually would be a great hat or shirt. I, let's make those. Yeah. I totally want to make those. I'm not even kidding with this one. I say stuff like that all the time, but I really That's mean right. it this time. But what he means by that is that the modern, modern men and women we have these souls that are obsessed with technology. So soul is anima in Latin and technica. Um, so with technology. So they're, they're technological souls. They're, they're consumed with technology, but they're vacuous, which means. Uh. But they don't even know it because technology just distracts us all the time. And so Balthazar will talk about how the modern world actually sacrifices the human person on the altar of and there, I don't know if there's a way to prove this to people. There probably, 
But I think for many of us, we hit a certain point in life where this is just, just clear that um, we have sacrificed. A person is meant to be in touch with real things. They're supposed to be in contact with real people, with God. And Thomas Merton, again, always says he's like, he's like, avoid, uh, avoid the stores of men as much. Turn off. He's like, turn off their blasphemies. Get out under God's clear sky that he made. Breathe the fresh air. If you can farm, you know, at his, his monastery, the, I think they farm Gethsemane. And it'll cleanse your soul. Um, here, real quick. You said Notre Dame. So we, shout we, this, shout see, out. This is another one of those homilies. You never know where we're going. That's right. right. We, um, we weren't going to talk about <laughs> Totally. You said Notre Dame. Shout out Bob Martin. Who's probably riding Zwift right now as we listen to this? He probably is. Um, Come on, so, Bob, pick it up. That's right. Pick um, it up. Go faster. Um, but it's something that I've also thought too. I've been trying to uh, just play with in my mind of, and I listen to somebody kind of say and explain this. Um, but like in the example of living in the monastery and mm-hmm. and being present to God's world versus technology. Yep. Is this concept of, you know, and especially when we start to highlight, we had Leonard, Dr. Leonard Sachs here and, mm-hmm. and his whole thing of really this emphasis on social media and um, technology and how that's affecting us. Yep. And I think there's a truth, but I'm also wondering of like how much as, a, as instead of technology being the cause, technology is just... Um, it is amplifying <clears throat> what already exists. So like you're insecure looking at Instagram and you're looking at somebody's fake life yeah, and you I, become jealous. But really, you, you remove, that's just a platform. Instagram could be a good platform or a bad platform w- based on are you an optimist, are you not, like that kind of scenario versus if you're in the monastery you still, I would assume, still have jealousy, envy, all the above. Correct. Um, so it, I don't know, the technology piece has been an interesting thing for me to wrestle with um, yeah, because so it's this, so demonized today. So here's how I would say that, is there's The reality has, this is, we're, we're not going to get to our topic because we're talking about today. No. Uh, reality has structure to it. And one of the basic structures of all reality is what? Plato and Aristotle, another great philosopher, uh, come to, which is matter. There's a technology in a certain sense can be natural, but let's get to matter. What do I mean? So, um, form is what a thing, the whatness. Aquinas, I don't know how it got, what it says in the Latin. I think it is, and I think it's quiditas in Latin. That sounds right. And, right? Well, it's, it's funny because you go to seminary and you study St. Thomas and the English translation, uh, the Dominicans who translated the Summa, at least in one translation, they translate and they use this word quiddity. And I remember being in philosophy in seminary and I'm like, what the hell is a quiddity? What does that mean? You know? And you're trying to act all smart in seminary. You're like, yeah, you know, you know, the quiddity of that thing. Yeah. That's right. But, but what it means is the, is the what. So, so you can say, you know, there's, uh, there's atoms that are present in granite and there's atoms that are present in, uh, I don't know, in the air, right? But, but the whatness of what those things are, is right? At, at the atomic level, it might be some communication stuff in trouble here. But the whatness of the thing is, is it's actual, it's its own thing. So this is a aspen tree instead of a tree. Okay. Right? Yep. The matter is what makes it an individual. So there's a form. The form, like there's aspen trees. And we can think of what an aspen tree is in the abstract. Like in your mind, when I say aspen tree, you can picture what an aspen tree is. Yep. But the matter of a particular aspen tree makes it an individual. Okay. Yep. Right. So, so there's an aspen tree, you know, in Vale, let's say, and it's a different one from one in Utah. 
Got it. And so the matter individual. Um, so how did I get on that? So we're talking about technology versus technology. Living in the like monastery. Kinda. So there's yes, that's this is what I was gonna get at. Thank you help for helping me. Matter and form. So so in a certain sense, and you can apply this to all kinds of things. Um but imagine like if I'm teaching a class on biology, which I would never do because I don't know much about biology. But imagine if you're teaching a class on biology, you could have the same content of what's supposed to be taught in a particular class. So you and I, somebody hands us and they say, hey, here's the material. I need, you to, I need both of you to go teach chapter four. Yep. That's the matter, right? But the way in this example that you and I teach would be the form. Got it. The way that we actually present that. Yep. Okay. So follow me one step further. So with technology and teaching, there's something called pedagogy. And pedagogy is the, is the kind of strategy or the way in which you teach. So you're, and it, it's kind of like the form. It's not just that you are um, teaching this content. Because we all know, like, you, 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 all of us, right, you're listening out there, you've had teachers who they might have given amazing content and you hated the class. That's right. But also, we can teach things not just by what we say, but by Totally. Here's my critique of technology. So technology, or it's, a, it's not a form. Technology is a, is a, uh, it's a medium. But pedagogically, and here's, here I'll just spell this out. My critique of technology is that the thing itself does so, so you going back to your example, you said you could have jealousy and lust, envy and pride and monster. Absolutely, hundred percent. That's going to be wherever you find humans. The question with technology, though, is that technology teaches us by the sort of thing it. So it trains us to be distracted. It trains us to interact with other people or things in a different way than something else. So an easy example of this, the easiest would probably be the way our, our attention spans are going. Okay. So you might say, so, and I'm, I'm stumbling today to kind of get my words out. No, I, I'm following. But you're, are you following? So Yeah, except for the crazy words you're using. But I'm following. Crazy the, words. The main Quiddity, topic. That thing. Task. So if you're, if I want to teach, Here would be a good example. So when I was at CU, I uh, was in the business school, and math is not my strength at all. And I had to take a calculus course. called. But in the business school, you had the option to take a real class, or you could do what was called math month. Do you have those? No, I don't think so. I've never heard of that. So math mods was a self-led it was the most failed class at all of CU. Probably and, why it wasn't there. Yeah. And what, what it was, was you kind of think, you're like, okay, I'm a freshman. I can, I have to take calculus. I could either go to a class, sign up, or I could do this math mod thing that's had a reputation for being easier, I guess. And what you do, you go to the, the you know, a certain office, you check out video. And back in those days, I don't know if we had, we must have DVDs. I don't know. Whatever it was. But you check out like a VHS. video. And literally, it's a videotape. And you put it on your laptop or whatever. And it's a guy who has note cards on a table. And he's teaching calculus by you watching the video. Here's the point. That the experience of going to a class and being in the presence of another human being is different from the experience of watching a pair of hands mediated through a video that you're not actually interacting with so technology there's an advantage there right like the advantage is you could actually uh, reach a lot more people through a video than yep. if you have to be in person <clears throat> yep but it's a different experience and so technology on one level is, is neutral because you can and so i think what you were getting at earlier patrick is the content you could teach the same math in a classroom or through a video yep so it's kind of neutral. It's the same content. But the form, the way in which it's presented is different. And when we do things through technology, that actually teaches us 
not by what the content is, but by the form. Do you see the advantage, like, on the, on the other side of that would be, and you kind of touched on that, but uh, let's say you don't have access. Like, if I want to study scripture, yep. right, and I live, um, I'm just, you know, either an isolated place or right. somewhere that's not going to have someone that you can necessarily turn to, um, but now I have the ability to turn into your RCIA class, and sure, it's I would much rather yep. prefer to be in person with you yep. and engage. But now as technologies progress, I do have the ability to FaceTime you or have that interaction yeah. to a different degree, obviously. This um, is great. I love, this is good stuff. This is yeah. Really good. Like I think as technology has progressed, it's also allowed us to have access to more people, access to people around the world um, on the drop of a dime. And or, you know, I think it'd be so miserable to watch no cards in hand kind of cruising through. But yeah, it wouldn't have to be that way. You could just do it with a professor at the board. Totally. Board. Professor at the board now and, yeah. and how it's done. Uh -huh. But also the ability, if that is the case, uh, to, like case in point right now, step studying. But it allows her, and she's doing it virtually, yep. allows her to be with Gianna all day. And then find her own time versus if it was a three o'clock class in Boulder, she has to leave the house, commute, go to class. Yep. Gianna's going to go to bed at seven. So it kind of creates a different dynamic um, that kind of opens us up to more things. Yeah, there's, there's obvious advantage, right? Yeah. There are. I mean, we're doing a podcast here and we started this Facts. because yeah. we just thought, you know, some of the conversations we've had. That these people don't get to have these, yeah. And then maybe this could help. And I think that that's an advantage. There's something good. And like you're saying, so Steph, you know, the convenience, the ease of things. Yep. That's. But what what I would argue is that those things are undeniable. That they're good and they're good. My point is that we don't oftentimes think about the negative flip side of that, though. Yep. Right. And so, um. So, for instance, uh, people have we, we we could say it a bunch of different ways, but people have tons of access to lots of information, but they don't know how to have a real conversation. Right. And so, so for instance, if you're listening to this podcast, we love that you're listening. Uh, when you get home from driving or from the gym or wherever you're at, uh, when Bob Martin finally gets off his bike. And Jason won. Father Jason won. That's right. <laughs> this is going to turn into our personal life. Like, I know. Our, our That's podcast. right. Uh, what are your human? And do you have, do you have the ability? Here, here's, here's one of my paradigmatic, love using big what words. The? Like a paradigm. Okay. Way, yeah. But anyway, the, um, a great like, example of this for me, I think about this a lot is music so the technology with recorded music has changed yep so the obvious advantage so on my iphone and on my computer i have the ability to listen to and and let's let's leave the debate about types of music off of this for okay. me but but let's say like i have yo-yo ma playing box cello suite which is a very famous i know I should have used something. Like, okay, so my Ariana Grande. Was Aerosmith. It? Was that Aerosmith? Aerosmith. Yeah, perfect. Uh, you have the ability to hear things on demand. Yep. Right? And another way to say this in philosophy, there's a, we could talk about the, the reflexive aspect of action. And the reflexive aspect of action means, uh, so if I, if I act upon an object, if I, it's easy to do this physical thing. If I um, move a boulder and I'm rolling it across my yard, I'm moving the boulder, but my moving it, there's a reflexive thing that's happening too, which is where it's like. Yeah, you ruined your grass. Ruined my, no, no, no. But, but even me physically, right? Okay. So with music, the, the obvious benefits are there. And I love it. I'm, I love music. I listen to it all the time. Try to keep my 
But here's what we don't think about. With all that we gain, we also lose the sense of uh, how precious music is. We lose silence is an obvious thing. The modern world has no silence. Yep. But I think of it, think of it this way. Most people in all of human history, when they wa- if they wanted to hear music that was beautiful, pretty much the only place they were going to hear it. Okay. Yep. And part of the consequence of that was you, you were going to appreciate it much more. Right? It's like uh, you really appreciate food when you're hungry. And so there's, there's an interplay between silence and, and I think the, a really Catholic mind desires both. Of them. There's, a, there's a famous C.S. Lewis line, I think it's from the Screw Tape Buddy, where he says, in hell, there's neither silence nor music, there's only nothing. Is that, is that a cool yeah. line? Yeah. But, <clears throat> but the reflex, but so with technology, what, it, what happened is I can have the best music in the world at the touch of my finger. Which means, that, which has consequences. There's really good consequences. There's also, uh, we don't have silence, so we don't appreciate music as much. Also, I think this is one of the reasons like it's hard to get people into a quiet church or in other ways, into a symphony. Because our souls are not cultivated to appreciate that, and so we don't work to kind of build that. If you If you only heard music, on Sundays and you only heard really, really good music, maybe once a year or something like that. We would put so much effort into having the best orchestras, symphonies, choirs, and it would be this collective effort. And I, and very, I guess I'm getting at, I'm stumbling around my words still today. I actually think that builds something better in certain ways than what we're still, and everything, everything is mediated through tech. Yeah. I think it's, <clears throat> as I'm preparing for this gala, I'm thinking about what classical means to me. And, mm-hmm. um, especially as classical education. To, that's right. Classical education. Yeah. Edu- yeah not, uh, classical education, just what I've seen. Obviously, I haven't, I'm not diving in and go sitting in class, but compared to when we've talked about it before, I mean, both of us went to all public schools and what, but I think the debate gets brought up a lot of times of STEM schools uh-huh. versus classical, right? And how you're kind of like approaching science, technology, blah blah blah, right? And knowing it has such an emphasis on that and classical, yeah. um, you know, I mean, <laughs> funny right now, getting ready for the gala, like I don't even have projection screens to use, like we have no technology right. anywhere to be found, right? Which I think it is so amazing, and I love it. But at the same time, at what point does life and where we're at, when does that actually kind of hinder the reality of where we're at? Like we are now outnumbered in technology. To get into your house right now, you have the a door code, it's no longer a key, right? And I'm not saying you know you can't operate that, but when everyday life is now you eventually turn to, Am- you know, your Alexa, say, Alexa, buy my groceries, and they restock it, Instacart come, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you're removing that piece, at what point does it, t- you know, and that's kind of my constant struggle of, I want so much peace. I want, honestly, I think I idolize the concept of like living in a relationship where yeah. it's just so minimalistic, just focusing on the right things, but it's really hard in day-to-day life. Uh, so when does it, when you're so uh, trying to stay away from the technology that it hurts you in the long, it, beca- it makes life more challenging. Yeah. And then also the one other thing I would say too is that I was talking to Steph about this the other day. I, I've been a big advocate of therapy and going to a therapist. But as of late, especially if I do workouts or any of that kind of stuff, and, and when you reference like the podcast scenario, is I have been filling myself with positive messages and people I looked up to 
up to in these podcasts or YouTube videos and motivational almost. And the difference being that if I go to therapy, which I still love, obviously, but if I spend 125, 150 bucks for an hour, once a week or once every two weeks, the ability to change your mindset on a whim every single day and fill yourself with that fished up Baron to um, Gary Vaynerchuk, whatever it's going to be, technology has allowed that to, uh, if you use it the right way, really. Uh, allow you to grow in that sense. It can certainly, and that's where there's there's obvious benefits. I'm not yeah, an yeah. anti technology person, but I think, but I also think that we're just. I guess the way I would say it for most of us, I I would say that we're not. We don't think about how we're. That's right. We're like drunk. That's right. We are. We're we're alcoholic. Technology is. You know, most people I think, and I've had this in my life before. It's even bring up stuff we're talking about today. I've had people in my life say, you just immediately, just, you're crazy. How dare you even question? You just want to live in a cave. Okay, yep. And of course technology brings great benefit. No one would deny that. The question is, are we less? Yeah. And I, and I, and I think anyone who actually um, do you actually think um, if you're someone who has depth to you, if you're someone who, um, I don't know, who's lived long enough, for most of us, I think it seems clear that we're a little. Yeah. I think I could see that um, cough today. from the standpoint of uh, my dad just went into this um, independent senior living. And he's <laughs> kind of like by far the youngest one, um, mm -hmm. just given his health and all that stuff. But um, you kind of see that, I guess, on the flip side of uh, what I'm saying with the ability to have interactions with people. Yeah. When I walk through there, there is no shot I'm making it from the front door to my dad's apartment without at least three of the residents who are probably in their 80s and uh -huh. above stopping me to talk about anything and especially when Steph and Gianna walk in oh, it's game over and I think you see that yearning for human interaction at the ultimate degree especially when you're later in life and obviously they didn't grow up with technology there's a huge gap there but it is that um, you know especially as you're getting older and facing death um, you really do uh aspire for that. There's, yeah, these are beautiful. How do I say this? I think, what what is this, what is it that we want? And honestly, I think because God, this is what going way back in our conversation to trendiness and the church being in the news, good publicity, any publicity, uh. In a certain sense, I think because God made the world a certain way, everything leads back. And so I think of even like a lot of people who really have a very strong distaste for religion. We see all this, what's this thing we see in our modern day? We see all these movements for real food, right? No one wants to eat artificial. They want real material. They want things um, that aren't fake and aren't highly processed. And we even see it, like, one of the greatest ironies, of course, is you have a lot of people who are embracing the church's teaching about contraception because they want what's real. And what this should do, I think, is it should push us to a place of what is it that we want out of life? What is it we're made for? And I think this is the heart of the question. And it goes to the gala on Saturday. But a human being, your favorite three things. Yep. Are you going to say it? No, go ahead. <laughs> you got to say it. Hard for me. I can't. So, so a human being is, and we, we should break it open a little bit because it be, I know it, it, it can be cheapened because people use this kind of in a cheap way. Yeah. But a human being is made for truth, goodness. And, and think about it this way. 
when a person says I'm not shopping at, I'm no longer going to eat at McDonald's. I'm only going to eat arugula salad from Whole Foods. Why do they do that? And I don't know if you want to chime in on that or not. But well, I want to see where you're going with that. Why do they? I think it's because they're looking for what is something that is good, not merely in the sense of what's useful to me, but something that has a depth of goodness to it. It's not, and it, this is, there's an analogy to technology. Okay. Technology is a good thing. Right. There's a good to this microphone. But human tech mediated realities, they don't plumb the depth the way that God could. And so, so I would say, for instance, a simple kind of next step would be, so, so a microphone is a good thing. It is good. But you know what's better is a human. Oh. The connect, like the true connection. Yeah. And, and ultimately, right, why does what what is a voice? Because a voice is a medium as well. Voice yep. is a voice is a medium for what's going on inside of my mind to be communicated, and that's a medium. It's it's, it's a, almost like a technology. In sense. Um, but but my point is is that I think what technology does is it counterfeits. Right. It 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 shows you this really shiny fun thing. And the reason why technology, we should just be wise about it. It's not the way to throw it out. Um, but the, way, the reason we should be wise about it is because it, it wants to lead us to lesser things. things. Things that truly have goodness in them and have a tremendous depth of goodness to them, they're not usually as flashy. Right? It's kind of like when you're when you're a 20, 20 year old CU and there's all these smoking hot girls walking around everywhere. You're like, Oh, I want that. You know? And the pro the problem with that with lust, right. And with that kind of world, um, is it's not as good as what's as, as the real person. That yep. Right. And that's what happens when you get married is you marry some babe and you find out that she's actually far better than you. You didn't want the, fake kind of just show that everybody puts on you want and I don't know deep water oh, I oh didn't Steph um it's funny you you mentioned something there and I heard this the other day uh Tony Robbins yep. and this this is a it involves technology but he had said that when he sends emails and I think there's a companion that does it um at least with text messages when he sends emails he only sends voice memos Father John tends to do that. I don't know if it's called. So I, I think there's a, an aspect that people do it for convenience and it's quick and it's easier than typing out or whatever. But Tony Robbins has come up with a place of he does that because technology, when you said disguises, it, um, he's like, it loses my tone. Like how many times have you read an email and you're like, oh, they're mad at me yeah. because they it's didn't a use a comma. Yeah. yeah. So he's like, I only send the voice memo. So you actually know my inflection in my voice as opposed to yeah. assuming anything in the email, um, which was just an interesting thing that you made me think of. But to your latter point, uh, this actually happened last night. I was um, sitting there. I got home late, and Jonna woke up. Steph put her down at like 7. She woke up at like 8.30. Brought her down, and she's hanging out. And so I was, I was pumped because I got to see her, but I was working on gala stuff. And I'm on the iPad cranking away. And I looked up. This crushed me, dude. I looked up and Gianna was sitting there staring at me with a smile. And it hit me, though, that I was so zoned in to the iPad that I literally, it crushed me. But then in a great way, I was also like, okay, putting this away. Until she goes back to sleep, I need to be here for her. Yeah. And the gala can wait. Yeah. And it, it was that reality of like, I was so zoned into the technology that my little girl sitting there, she's still trying to figure out life and how to roll over, yeah. is naturally staring at dad. I had no clue. I don't know how long she was doing that. 
but I just so happened to look up and I was like, what am I doing? Yeah. And I think you, you do have that with technology and yep. you, you have that, like you're saying the, um, the ability to escape and hide out in yeah. that, which is some insecurity, but technology has done that. And also, as you've been saying, I think the one kind of elephant in the room for as much good as there's been with technology, I think it's completely created a whole new, uh, disadvantage with, you know, pornography is at an all time high. Yeah. You have a lot of this stuff when it comes to lust, you know, uh, it's also a really slippery slope and yeah. it has made things more accessible to the dangers of life, uh, or the, uh, temptation, yeah. uh, versus that simple kind of, uh, in the community. Yeah. And I think we've kind of said it a bunch of ways, but technology exists and technology is ancient. You know, now we think of right. You know, why stop? Um, but in the ancient world, there's technology. Technology are are human made things that that exist to make things they're convenient, right? So, um, so a hammer is technology. Yeah, and it really is. And a hammer is a good thing. Like it has a particular purpose. But we just in the modern world do we? And it's not just now. I'm sure. It's history but do we stop and think about it? wow this hammer makes my life a lot easier uh great but do we stop and think about like the ways in which it's affecting the world and saint augustine maybe another piece here he has and this this is, goes back again um even a lot of these things kind of overlap today but early in the podcast quoting that news story about pope francis and the pet yep um, and utilitarianism. So the utilitarian here's and here's like one of the Catholic points. The utilitarianism kind of says, well, the world's a better place if everybody owns a hammer, and we can calculate. So if if we have, you know, six billion people, well, not then not everybody can get a laptop. So there's less pleasure, and it's uh, so therefore it's worth. It. The Catholic mind says. You've completely missed what good goodness can't be calculated by possessing it or having a seven on the pleasure, right? That's what utilitarianism says. Um, Augustine says uh, he's talking, of course, about people in his own time, and he says that oftentimes people are they're more pained if their villa is poor than if their life is bad, as if man's and this is the great line he says as if man's greatest good was to possess all good things and here's what Augustine means by happiness in life isn't that I have more vacations I've got more uh, gadgets I've got more cars and some TV but what if you're not good yourself what if you're selfish and you're filled with envy and pride selfishness um, so the, the, the Catholic mind wants to push us toward what is good in and of itself and you can only see that and I guess maybe and this is, gosh this could lead to like some other podcast or something but the only the, you can't just see that like to perceive what is really good is more than uh, just a, something is you can't just go out and just Material. see what's good. You have to be a certain kind of person to perceive. And do you think? Do you think that um, obviously the good being centered around <coughs> God? Um, but do you think the, I guess, uh, means or form of that that's like indiv- individual, uh, individualistic versus like subjective? Like everybody has their own form of God being in the center, but we all are great at something particular. Yeah. I mean, of course we are. And, and the, the good is everything God created has good in it. Yep. But I, th- I think the point I'm trying to draw. Oh. So if, if, if one person says, Hey, well, father Brian, I know that, um, I know that you really love, uh, Caravaggio and his painting. 
but I, you know, not me. I actually just prefer like, uh, I don't know. Banks. Banks here. Let's do something more extreme. Something just kind of lame. Like, I, I prefer modern art that's, you know, a pile of bricks, huh? Which I actually saw out of modern art. Great. So the question is though, is there, is it just that we have different tastes and preferences? Or is it actually that in the Catholic mind with this, the Catholic mind and many other types of minds, by the way, not just Catholic, but the great minds of philosophy tend to say, um, it's not as if you see a Caravaggio and, and you don't like it and that's somehow just because you have a different taste. Oftentimes it's because you haven't become cultured enough and wise enough to actually perceive. Right? Like it's, there is a certain, it, these things are not purely subjective. So for instance, another, another analogy, would, an easier analogy would be when a kid says, Hey, mom and dad, I hate filet mignon. I want mac and cheese. Is that just because a child has, you know, well, different strokes for different folks? That's no, because a child has not yet learned to appreciate the taste. And so the, the Catholic mind wants to say, and again, Plato and Aristotle would both say this as well, is that, you know, if one guy says, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the beauty of, of a mother's love for her child. And another guy says, well, not me. That's stupid. I prefer the Bronx. The guy who says that is missing. It's not just that they have different opinions. It's that the, the person who can't perceive the beauty of a mother's love for her child has actually missed something about reality because he hasn't, he has not cultivated his soul in a way. Does that make sense? It does for sure. I think, I mean, in, <clears throat> all those examples with the exception of the filet mignon, um, I think that uh, depiction of us in that sense, like you, um, it'd be very easy to point a lot of things. Like you enjoy reading and deep reading and I don't. Mm -hmm. And your music taste, um, I would rather read than listen to what you mainly <laughs> listen to. And, um, but I think the question kind of being like, getting my soul or my, you know, any part of me to get to that maturity level of uh, seeing the beauty, I guess would probably rely in, because I just don't have the desire, right? So that begs the sure. question of like, if, if that doesn't speak to me, am I destined in your example of like, and I don't particularly care even for sports or football that much, but if it was the Broncos scenario mm -hmm. that I can find something so deep and share that with the world. Yep. Uh, and that's my kind of calling versus like, it would take a lot for me to really dive into that in my mind now of um, books and music at your level that right. I just don't have, I just don't particularly care, yep. I guess. And I find something else. So it's, I get it, but I also think like, what is, different between us that makes us our own individual than ultimately being like we finally made it and we're all in a kumbaya of Beethoven. Yeah. This is a, the right question. Thanks, man. It's, it's, it's a really important <laughs> question. So, so being, being a Christian and, and not just being a Christian but perceiving the good and the true and the beautiful yeah. is not the same thing as not. Does that as, make sense? As what? As being a snob. Okay. Right. So, like, I, I can probably give that impression sometimes of, like, oh, you know, you have to, you have to read this book, and then you've got to listen to Palestrina, and then you've got to go to this art exhibit. And I think those things are profoundly good, but honestly, the Catholic, and this is what Tom, Thomas Merton's very good at this. The really Catholic mind. It's not that you have to have really high art, but that's the goal. That's not even the goal. Yeah. And and by the way, the crucifixion flips this on. These are very interesting questions. Um, the, the saint, which is the true goal of our lives, becomes saint. The saint doesn't need to go to a Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Um, the saint, oftentimes, and this goes back to the bread example, the saint can see an ordinary thing, how extraordinary it is. Got it. 
So the saint can mean baking bread in the kitchen for his wife and kids. And he perceives good at a depth that other people don't. I will, I will say this. Um, the one part that is really rubbed off on me was I've always kind of looked at art. I mean, I was that example of mm-hmm. like, I definitely do like pink stuff. I do too, by the way. And I never appreciated art. Like you couldn't, I have zero desire to go to a museum and look at it, right? I, yeah, keep going. So it wasn't until you have two pieces of art. So I think, I think, <laughs> not that double up on the word here, but the art of getting to the truth, beauty, and goodness also relies on finding or um, finding the right teacher, being the right teacher, because I've never had the desire, interest, motivation, or have ever come across anybody that has inspired me to understand and appreciate art. Yeah. And you have The Last Supper, which I've seen a million times. Right. And it wasn't until... And even in your own house, like I've seen it a million times. I just walked right. by, I'm like, oh, okay, cool, I get it. But when you explained it to me and explained every aspect of it and, and helped me, because I can't remember the name of it, which is also a fascinating documentary on Netflix because now it's missing in the world. Oh, yeah. um, is that piece of art where, what's it called? Storm on the Sea of Galilee. That. You know, I, I would walk by that and be like, okay, that's all right. You know, I... I I don't know really what that is. It looks okay. But when you walked me through it, blew my mind. And now it's like, for sure, one of my favorite paintings. But I would have never. So I guess that was a, the, I was lucky to have you explain that. So maybe at that yeah. point, you can, you can learn and appreciate different aspects of beauty. Yeah. Uh, that otherwise, though, if you're not introduced to it, you'll never know. Yeah. And we should wrap this up. But I do want to say that and I agree with you. But I even think like so much of this, it does help to have like teachers and friends and a dialogue. Yep. And when that happens, it's kind of miraculous, mm-hmm. honestly. When, when we touch these things and they open up our souls, it's a miraculous moment. And, uh, but I think a lot of it too is just how do we, even aside from great art, how do we become the kind of people and i think this is where silence is so important there's just something it does to us but there's if if you're in boulder and there's a beautiful sunset there's the easy thing for all of us to do is we're so busy it's like oh that's pretty and you just keep running and you go to the next thing and and i think what the great tradition of Western civilization, both Christian and non Christian. And this this could be this has been made uh, trite and shallow by Logan. Stop and smell the roses kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that's trite. But there's a certain type of person who actually stops and is amazed that in a, the beauty in a sunset opens his or her soul to something beyond the day-to-day existence. Yep. And I need a new computer. And I want more junk in my phone. And, and so I think, again, and this, I'm so glad you brought this up, that being someone who encounters truth, goodness, and beauty is not the same thing as being culturally immersed in a great class. I think those play things, those things are important. But the simple, the simple saint out there, like there's saints out there, right, who have no education, right? But they see more profoundly, and they can perceive beauty much more profoundly than the most educated person in our. And that has to do with soul. Uh, and ha- is your soul open? When how many people now, as you described that setting in Boulder, are on the run? They're like, oh, that is absolutely beautiful. Pull out the phone, take a photo, right, and then peace out. Yeah. Or, or you, you are at how many concerts have I gone to that people are just recording the video, watching it on their phone, and the right. artist is right in front of them. What a, that's a perfect thing. 
and it's it, gosh, we could, this could be a two-hour podcast. But it's like, I think part of that also is I want to play things. Yep. And there's almost like this human clinging. You know, I want to own this moment. I want to own this concert. I want to own this sunset. And you know, someone probably right now is rolling their eyes, going, "You idiot! Like, can't you just not think too deeply about this one?" But, but there's something deep there of like, I want to own this moment forever. Yep. You can't do that. Can't you just surrender yourself to receive something good? Yeah. And I think the other aspect of that too is it's a, it's a really interesting um, reflection to be like, are you doing that to impress somebody else? Yeah. Right. You're going to take that. You're going to post on Instagram and try to get the affirmation for just enjoying it for yourself and not caring what everyone else is thinking, but you're trying to put on this facade of like, look where I was at, look what I was doing, all that kind of stuff of like, what is your true motivation? Like who needs to know that? Who really cares? Yeah. And I oftentimes think there's like, subconsciously there's fear beneath all this. Yep. Because this is so great, but there's not going to be another great moment. So I got to capture this. And I got impressed. Totally. And I've got to impress this person. And this is why I surrender. This is like so what Mary is all about is that I don't have to cling into something and own something because I goodness and ultimately the goodness in God is something that I can, that is trustworthy that I can surrender myself to and find joy because I know that God is going to provide truth, goodness and beauty. Yeah. Last point Infinitely. I'll make the, Steph's going to crush me on this. It's as you're saying that she just sent me a photo um, that she came across um, for a wedding. Somebody sent us a really nice bottle of wine and it's somewhat sentimental. I know the people that own the winery and they sent it and blah, 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 but it's been sitting on our counter and she will always, she's funny. I mean, she'll come in. Hey, I want a glass of wine for dinner. Uh, Can I open that bottle? And I'm like, what? (laughs) No. Yeah. Unless we're going to finish that thing off. But I've lived in the perspective of every time we, uh, other than those random moments, never the right moment. For me. And in my mind, I'm like, I want to open this bottle in the perfect moment. But I think I'm also holding on to it from, uh, I'll never get this again. Or yeah. I need to possess this for some crazy moment in life that's like this. We made it. Let's have this bottle and she right. sent me this photo that was like um just open it was literally like just open the bottle of wine don't get it. something like that yeah and it and it is it definitely comes from a place of like scarcity and um you know this desire for something so great yeah. instead of just being great man I need to open that bottle. i'll open that bottle of wine after the gala <laughs> all right well, folks deep stuff today um I hope that, you know, if you haven't turned us off by now, hour and eight minutes in. Um, Bob Martin's still writing. Bob Martin's still writing. Wunch is like... Oh, he's, started. yeah. He's in this. But we hope, you know, there's something... I'm inspired by this conversation where I'm like, I just want to encounter what's real and, and human, and I want to let go of my desire to possess all things. Uh, so we hope you can do that. Go talk to your wife. Go talk to your husband, your kids. Enjoy sunset. Um, make make your own bread. Yeah, and once you're done with that, hop back on technology. Email us at rant at lowdenver dot org. <laughs> <laughs> Send us your questions and like us on all platforms. Um, we also, real quick, maybe moving away a little bit from a YouTube feature. Uh, Ryan puts in so much work, and yeah. apparently, most of our viewers of- are bots from Russia. So nice, um, I love those bots. Yes, maybe someday we'll bring it back, but I think uh, to, for Ryan's sanity, we Stick may move away audio. from that. So you can listen in, and uh, again, we appreciate all the support. Share us with your friends, and um, do that after you um, go in silence for a little while. Yep, see you at the gala. Right. All right, peace out.